Now let's talk about friction. This is another one of the forces that we're going to be encountering very frequently when solving physics problems. Let me start the discussion by showing you a little animation where we are pulling on a block using a rubber band, which would be the blue line that you see there. So if you the object is at rest, the block is at rest on a table, and you start pulling gently on that rubber band, what you would observe is that there is no motion of the block. Initially, the rubber band will just stretch little by little until you reach a point where the force that the rubber band is applying to the block is big enough to break the block loose from its contact with the table. When that happens, the block would start to move. Now, once the block is moving, you know that if there is no force pulling on the block, the block would eventually come to rest due to the friction between the block and the table. The contact force between the block and the table has a perpendicular component that we call normal and a tangential component that we call friction. Friction is the force responsible for slowing down the motion of the block in this part of the motion. And at the beginning, friction is the force responsible for holding the block in place while you're pulling on it. What is the origin of the force of friction between two objects? Well, any two surfaces, no matter how well polished they are, once they are in contact with each other, they will not fit perfectly together. If you were to look at the surfaces with a microscope, what you will notice is that there is a lot of irregularities. And at the places where the high points of one surface get really close to the high points of the other surface, there are molecular bonds that form at those locations. In a magnified view of the two high points on both of the surfaces, you can see that the, the uh, spike in the upper surface gets in very close contact with the spike in the bottom surface. And when those two atoms, the white one and the yellow one, get close together, there are molecular bonds that form between them, which produce a certain kind of stickiness between the two surfaces at the points where the two surfaces get, get close together. Notice that most of the surfaces of these two surfaces are not in contact with each other. The lower points on each surface are far away from each other. The two surfaces are only very close together at some specific points. These are the points that give rise to the force of friction. The force of friction, as we're going to see in an equation, is dependent on the normal force between two objects. This is due to the fact that if you were to press these two surfaces with a greater force, the number of points where the two surfaces would come in close contact would increase, therefore increasing the frictional force between the two surfaces. We talk about three different kinds of frictional forces that arise at the contact surfaces between two objects. The first kind is static friction. This is the kind of friction that occurs when an object is at rest with respect to the other object, but there is an applied force. An example of static friction would be at the beginning of the animation, where we had the rubber band pulling on the block, but there is no motion of the block produced by that force. So the tension, the force T acting on the block, is not strong enough to make the object move. So if there is no relative motion between the two objects, we talk about static friction. The static friction in this case is again due to the high points on the lower surface. Those high points prevent the upper surface from sliding to the right. This opposing force to the applied force of the rubber band is what we call static friction. If the block is simply sitting on the surface and there is no force pulling on it, then the force of friction will have a value of zero. The value of the static friction in this case is equal to zero. But as the applied force 
increases in magnitude, the static friction has to increase in value to prevent the motion of the block. As the applied force increases, friction increases all the way up to a maximum value of mu sub s times n. Mu sub s is called the coefficient of static friction and is the normal force between the two surfaces. As we said before, friction does depend on the normal force, on how hard the two surfaces are pressed together. More normal force gives more points of contact between the two surfaces. Now it is an experimental fact that the force of friction cannot grow beyond this maximum value of mu sub s times n. We can write that in an equation that says that F sub s, which is the force of static friction, should be less or equal to mu sub s times n. The bigger the n, the more points of contact, which increases the force of friction, and the coefficient mu sub s depends on the two surf surfaces that are in contact. There is a coefficient of static friction unique for every couple of surfaces that are in contact. For example, the coefficient of static friction between rubber and cement might be something like 0 0.8. The coefficient of static friction between cement and cement might be 0 0.5 and so on. It depends on the particular su uh, surfaces that are in contact with each other. Now what is the direction of the force of static friction? The direction of the force of friction is always opposite to the would-be velocity that object A would have with respect to B if there was no friction between the two surfaces. So in the case of block A, if there was no friction with block B, when you apply an external force T, the velocity of A with respect to B will be to the right. In the case where you have actually friction between A and B, there will be a force of static friction acting in a direction opposite to the direction in which A would move with respect to B if there was no friction. The second type of force of friction that can occur between two objects is when there is actual motion between the two surfaces. When one object, when the surface of one object is moving with respect to the other object. In this case, the force of friction, as determined experimentally, has a constant value equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal between the two surfaces. The coefficient of kinetic friction, as the coefficient of static friction, also depends on the specific surfaces that are in contact with each other. In general, the coefficient of kinetic friction is smaller than the coefficient of static friction. The direction of the force of kinetic friction that B puts on A is opposite to the direction in which object A moves with respect to B. So if you have an object A sliding on top of an object B with a velocity, say, to the right, you can be sure that the kinetic force of friction that B puts on A, this is the force of friction acting on A, is opposite to the direction of the velocity of A with respect to B. So to summarize what we have said about static friction and kinetic friction, we can do a plot of uh, applied force and friction between two objects. So in the specific case of a block on a table and a force, an applied force pulling on the block, we've seen that when the applied force is small, the frictional force is small. When the applied force is zero, there's no friction. No, there's no static friction necessary to keep the block in place. When the applied force starts to grow, the static friction starts to grow. The more applied force, the bigger the force of friction. More applied force, bigger static friction. And this behavior continues up to a maximum of mu sub s times n. When the applied force reaches this value mu sub s times n, then the force of friction between the two surfaces can no longer continue to increase. As you apply more force, the object dislodges and starts to move, and the force of friction between the two surfaces drop. It drops to a value that is equal to the value of the kinetic friction between the two surfaces, which is mu k times n. Remember that in general, mu sub k is smaller than mu sub s. So the force of friction as the object starts to move drops in magnitude.
So we can say that there's two regions, the static and the kinetic region, where for an applied force less than mu sub s n, there is no motion, and the kind of friction present is static, and for an applied force bigger than mu sub s times n, there is motion between the two surfaces, and we're talking about kinetic friction. A third kind of frictional force between two surfaces is the case when one of the objects is rolling on top of the other. So say a ball rolling on a surface. In this case, the force of friction, just as before, occurs because of the irregularities between the surface of the ball and the surface on which it's rolling. Once again, the high points of both surfaces, when they come in close contact, uh, develop molecular bonds between them, which act as a sort of a glue, which ends up slowing the motion of the ball across the surface, in the same way as a runner running on a sidewalk full of chewing gum will have its velocity decrease because of the stickiness of the surface. Just like static and kinetic friction, rolling friction also depends on the normal force between the surfaces. In general, the coefficient of static friction is bigger than the coefficient of kinetic friction, which is much bigger than the coefficient of rolling friction. The fact that the coefficient of rolling friction is much smaller than the coefficient of kinetic friction is the reason why the invention of the wheel was so important. Placing an object on wheels saves an enormous amount of energy that would otherwise be wasted in overcoming kinetic friction and warming up the two surfaces that are rubbing against each other. Let's uh, work on a problem where we're using this, uh, the force of friction. Um, suppose that we want to calculate the maximum acceleration that Usain Bolt could ever reach if his preferred running shoes had a coefficient of static friction of 0 0.5. Now why should there be a maximum acceleration for a runner? Let's start by looking at a sketch of the situation. When you're running, what you're doing is you're kicking your legs back, the leg that is in contact with the surface is pushed back by the body, so in the absence of friction the motion of that foot would be back in the direction of the white arrow, but when there is friction, the direction of the static friction is therefore opposite to that and it pushes you forward. This is the force that provides the acceleration necessary for a runner. If we were to do a free body diagram for a runner, the free body diagram would have three basic forces. The normal force uh, coming from the ground, supporting the weight of the person, the weight of the person due to the attraction of the earth, and the force, the static force of friction between the shoe and the ground. The only force acting in the x direction is the force of static friction. This is the only force that can accelerate the body. So if we apply Newton's second law, the sum of the forces in the x-direction equal to the mass times the acceleration in the x-direction, we have that the force of static friction should be equal to the mass times the acceleration. Now static friction has a maximum value of mu sub s times n. So since in this problem we're concerned with the maximum acceleration possible, we're going to be using the force of static friction at its maximum possible value, which is mu sub s times n. We do need to figure out how much is the normal force between the person and the floor. For that we write Newton's second law in the vertical direction, the sum of the forces should be equal to zero, because the acceleration in the vertical direction is zero. The runner is neither flying above the surface or sinking into the surface. So that means the acceleration in the vertical direction must be zero, which implies that the normal force is equal to the weight of the runner. Using this, then the force of friction, which is mu sub s times the normal, which is the force of gravity, should be equal to the mass times the acceleration. And using that the force of gravity is mg, we end up with an expression for the acceleration that is equal to mu sub s times g. The ultimate limit for the acceleration that can be achieved by a runner is determined by the kind of shoes that the runner is using. The kind of shoes used by the runner determine the coefficient of static friction, and that coefficient multiplied by g gives the maximum possible acceleration of this runner.
for the specific problem that we're dealing with, with a coefficient of static friction of 0 0.5, we obtain a maximum acceleration of 4.9 meters per second square. So no matter how powerful the legs of the runner are, no runner using shoes with a coefficient of static friction of 0 0.5 could ever run faster or could ever accelerate faster than 4.9 meters per second square. Now using this result, and just to make sure that you're paying attention, uh, I want you to answer the question in all space. If you're saying Bolt could run maintaining an acceleration equal to his maximum theoretical acceleration, just this cause, for mu sub s equals 0 0.5, what would be his time running the 100 meter race? How much time would it take Usain Bolt to run the 100 meter race? Please calculate this and answer in our space.